Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Virtual Grand Rounds series hosted by the Continuing Medical Education Department of the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Alex Ray Grant, Staff Neurologist at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis. I will be moderating these virtual Grand Rounds on multiple sclerosis and related disorders. We hope you find these topics in MS timely, enlightening, and ultimately of use in helping you care for your patients with MS and related disorders. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Fox, Staff Neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic. He is a recognized expert in MS and has received grant support from the National Institute of Health, the National MS Society, the Department of Defense for his research in MRI imaging techniques in MS, pathology of MS, and investigating vascular abnormalities in the MS population. He has participated and been a lead investigator for many clinical trials and has specifically investigated risk tolerance in the MS population. Dr. Fox received his BA from Amherst College and his medical degree from Johns Hopkins. He trained in neurology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, then did a fellowship in MS at the Mellon Center and a Master's of Clinical Research at Case Western University. He just recently stepped down as the medical director for the Mellon Center and is now part of an international group studying progressive forms of MS. Dr. Fox will talk about the emerging topic of risk mitigation in MS therapeutics. He will review for us how the landscape of therapeutics in MS has changed over the past few years so that decision-making is no longer just picking one of a handful of relatively safe injectables. The task is now one of matching a complex variety of medicines with different efficacies and mechanisms of action to the individual patient and their preferences. He will illuminate the delicate balance of risk and benefit in medical treatment focusing on the principle of first, do no harm, and we'll discuss ways that we can mitigate the risk of medication through appropriate testing and assessment of patient comorbidities prior to beginning a therapy. Well, thank you, Alex, and it's a pleasure to join you today. Today's program will focus on risk mitigation in multiple sclerosis therapies. Here are my disclosures. And I also want to acknowledge the help of Dr. Daniel Antoneda from the Cleveland Clinic, who is a colleague of mine who has been helpful in discussions on this topic and contributions to this presentation. Let's start with a case. A 35-year-old woman is diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis and asks for guidance on choosing a long-term MS therapy. What factors would you consider in choosing an MS therapy? What risks should be balanced when choosing a treatment? And what individual characteristics affect those risks? This will be the topic of our discussion today. The objectives of this program are to understand the risks of complications from long-term MS therapies, to appreciate the patient-specific factors that can impact that risk from MS therapies, and thus guide the choice of MS therapies. And finally, to recognize strategies to minimize the risk from long-term MS therapies. Let's start with a couple slides of background about risk and treatment. First, it's important to recognize that risk is present in all human activities. There is risk from a disease injury, and as we turn to treatments, there's almost always a potential adverse risk of complications for treatment. Medicine has been founded on some principles, including first, do no harm. This goes back thousands of years. But really, that's probably a, a bit outdated and somewhat utopian view of medicine. When we use treatments, there's really no treatment that doesn't have some potential risk. And it's really a balance of the risk versus the benefit, which is the better way to view our treatments. This shows what I think is a better approach and understanding of risk in treatments, and that is a balance. A balance of the benefits, when we consider multiple sclerosis, it's the absence of relapses, stopping the disease progression, maintaining the function of a patient, and hopefully protecting the brain and the spinal cord, so-called neuroprotection. Those benefits need to be balanced against the potential for adverse events or complications, side effects or a difficulty in tolerating a medicine decreased quality of life that can arise from either the disease or the treatment, and loss of independence uh, where patients have to be reliant on other people or other things. And then there's also a cost of treatment and there's a cost to the disease itself. 
when we consider risk with medical therapies, there's two main categories that we consider. One is risk evaluation, which is the understanding of risk of a therapy, particularly as it applies to an individual. This can then lead to risk stratification to identify the specific risks that may be present in one patient versus another. There is also risk mitigation, which involves efforts to decrease the likelihood of a complication or an adverse event. And if complication does occur, to improve the outcome of that complication. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has formalized that into a risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, or REMS, requirement for some drugs or therapies that are thought to have high risks. When we apply this to multiple sclerosis therapy, we find that early on, before 2004, this was a relatively simple paradigm. We only had four FDA-approved therapies. They were in two classes. They all had relatively similar efficacy. That was modest. They all had relatively similar tolerability, and they were all quite safe. So risk strategies were more simple back then. Now in 2013, we have 10 FDA-approved therapies for MS, and they span six different classes of therapy. There's widely variable efficacy, variable tolerability, and also widely variable safety. So now the choice of MS treatment is quite a bit more challenging. And importantly, patient-specific risks from therapies can help guide us in our choice of treatment. For today's program, I will be reviewing the risks of MS therapies that are shown here, walking through the injectable therapies, natalizumab, fungolamide, terraflutamide, and dimethylfumarate. My dizantrone is still an FDA-approved therapy, but I will not be discussing that here because it is currently rarely used because of cardiac risks as well as risk of leukemia. So turning first to the injectable agents. These have been available for about 20 years, include interferon and glutiramer acetate. Overall, they are considered modestly effective and quite safe. Nonetheless, there still is a role for risk evaluation and risk mitigation with these therapies. The benefits, roughly a 30% reduction in annualized relapse rate among patients taking these therapies. Starting first with interferons, there are a number of risks that have become recognized. Flu-like side effects, increased liver enzymes, leukopenia or decreased white blood cell count, headache, depression, worsening of spasticity. These are all quite commonly seen with interferons. There are a number of ways we can mitigate these risks for flu-like side effects using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory therapies and hydration, monitoring liver function, both before starting treatment and then on treatment, monitoring the blood counts as well before treatment and during treatment. In patients with headache and pain syndromes, one may want to avoid interferons. And the same in patients with depression, to screen for depression before using treatment and screening for worsening or ongoing depression while on treatment. Turning to glutiramer acetate, this tends to have a little bit less risks, but still there are skin reactions that are very commonly seen in patients, including erythema, lipoatrophy, and induration. There is also an immediate post-injection systemic reaction. This is a chest tightness and shortness of breath. From the patient's point of view, it feels like a cardiac problem, but it turns out it does not have a cardiac etiology and is more of a systemic reaction and is seen in up to a third of patients. So mitigating the risks of glutiramer acetate involve predominantly education, proper injection techniques to reduce the risk of skin reactions, and also education for the post-injection systemic reaction. This rarely needs to have medical evaluation, although oftentimes it's very disconcerting to patients, and so they will seek medical evaluation. And really, it does not need to have further testing, because usually it's very short, self-contained, and typically does not recur or would recur very rarely. 
Let me turn now to natalizumab. So the risks of natalizumab are mainly three, and that's progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML, a brain infection, allergic reactions, and increase in liver enzymes. The benefits, natalizumab is generally considered to be one of the most effective MS therapies that we currently have available. And so that's where we have to balance that benefit with some of those risks. So let's talk a little bit about these risks. First, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML. This is a brain infection that's caused by reactivation of a latent virus, the JC virus, or John Cunningham virus. So it's first described in patients with AIDS, but now has been recognized to be associated with a variety of immune suppressing or immune modulating conditions, including therapies. This is thought to be related in patients treated with natalizumab to a decreased surveillance of immune cells into the central nervous system. Importantly, this infection is associated with a very high mortality rate. In patients treated with natalizumab, it's about 20 to 40 percent mortality rate. And similarly, importantly, there is no proven effective treatment for PML. So stratifying for the risk of PML, there's been recognized to be three main factors that determine the risk of PML in patients treated with natalizumab. These involve the presence of latent JC virus infection, and this can be detected with a serologic test or a blood test, prior immunosuppressant use, and duration of natalizumab treatment. And let's walk through each of these. First, the JC virus serology. Latent infection with the JC virus is a prerequisite for developing the brain infection called PML. There is now a diagnostic assay that can detect latent JC virus infection. It doesn't detect the actual virus itself, but the serologic response or antibody response to the virus. The sensitivity appears quite high, about 97, 98 percent, and the specificity is a little difficult to estimate because it's hard to prove whether a patient uh, is infected or not, but one can simply look at whether the serology is positive. Nonetheless, the false negative rate is thought to be about 2 percent, so relatively low. In patients who are JC virus negative, it has been found that they are at very low risk of PML. Nonetheless, there still is some risk of PML in patients who are JC virus negative. This arises from a false negative assay result, so patients who test negative but actually have the virus, although repeated negative tests appear to lower that false negative rate considerably. There is also a seroconversion rate. So about 1% to 2% of patients who are negative for the JC virus will seroconvert to positive each year. So one negative test doesn't mean the patient is always negative. In a JC virus negative patient, the risk of PML nonetheless appears to be very low, although is not zero, and that has led to the recommendation to recheck JC virus status every six months in patients who are receiving treatment with natalizumab. The duration of treatment with natalizumab also appears to impact the risk of PML. This chart shows the incidence of PML according to treatment duration. This is a monthly infusion, so each of these epochs represent roughly one year of treatment. One can see during the first year, the risk is about 0.5 per thousand patients. This rises gradually into the third year, 25 to 36 infusions, of 1.84 per thousand, and appears to relatively plateau uh, between 1.8 and 2.3 per thousand patients. There is also an increased risk of PML in patients who have previously received immunosuppressants. Putting all three of those risk factors together, one can see that there is a widely variable risk of PML depending on which factors are present. This table allows one to calculate the risk of PML in an individual patient according to their JC virus serology status, whether they have previously received immunosuppressants, 
and their duration of therapy if it's under 24 months or over 24 months. As one can see, in a patient who tests positive for the JC virus, has received prior immunosuppressants, and has been on natalizumab for over 24 months, the risk of PML is about 1 in 50. In contrast, a patient who does not have the JC virus seropositive blood test, who has not received prior immunosuppressant, and has been on natalizumab for less than 24 months, the risk is about 1 in 45,000. Clearly, the risk of PML is dramatically different depending on the patient-specific characteristics as described here. So turning now to mitigation, how can we mitigate the risk of PML with natalizumab? Well, JC virus serology is a first start to help stratify risk. Patients who are JC virus negative, natalizumab is considered quite safe but there still is a need to recheck JC virus serology every six months. Patients who are JC virus positive, one may want to consider alternate treatment options in that patient. If that therapy is needed to be used, typically it's limited to 12 to 24 months, and then the patient is transitioned to a different therapy. One would want to further avoid the use of natalizumab in a JC virus positive patient if they had received prior immunosuppressants. The patient does need to go on the therapy. One could consider more intense monitoring, such as every six months or perhaps even more frequently, to monitor for MRI changes suggestive of PML. And although PML symptoms should be monitored continuously in all patients treated with natalizumab, in patients who are JC virus positive, one would want to have an even higher vigilance of monitoring for symptoms potentially suggestive of PML. Now, PML isn't the only risk with natalizumab, but there are other risks, including allergic reactions, elevated liver enzymes, and leukopenia. So there are some strategies that can help reduce or minimize these risks with natalizumab. They include monitoring for anti-natalizumab antibodies. Patients with prior natalizumab use are more likely to have an allergic reaction to natalizumab, as well as patients with a history of anaphylaxis. Liver enzyme and leukopenia are mostly through monitoring as with the other therapies. So let me turn now to fingolimod. So fingolimod has a number of risks that are important to keep in mind in patients who might go on it. There are cardiac events with the first dose, herpes virus infections, macular edema, liver enzyme abnormalities, and lymphopenia. The benefits of fingolimod are about a 50% reduction in annualized relapse rates. Let me go through some of these risks. So cardiac events focus mostly around bradycardia, or a slowing of the heart rate. This decreased heart rate is seen most prominently the first time the patient uh, is exposed to the drug, and therefore the patient needs to be monitored for the first six hours while receiving the drug. In patients who are at elevated risk or who have abnormalities in the first six hours, that monitoring should be continued out to 24 hours. The complication appears to arise from a slowing of the AV conduction, and that can sometimes lead to first or second degree AV block. There are also some case reports of cardiac arrest or asystole and rare ventricular arrhythmias, although the predominant complication seen with this drug is a bradycardia. So how do we mitigate the cardiac risk with fingolimod? Well, first, an EKG at baseline is critical in order to evaluate patients for potential cardiac problems. Also, a history is important to identify potential risk factors, which would increase the risk of a patient having cardiac complications. First dose observation is required in all patients, and that goes for the first six hours after receiving the drug. There is frequent monitoring of vital signs, and then at the end of the six hours, there is a post-dosing EKG to monitor for EKG changes after treatment. For high-risk patients, that six-hour observation is extended to 24 hours, 
and there are some concomitant medications that can increase the risk of cardiac complications and would make one not want to use that drug or to discontinue those drugs before starting fingolimod. Some contraindications based on the cardiac risk. Within the last six months, myocardial infarction, unstable angina, stroke, uh, transient ischemic attack, or TIA, or decompensated heart failure. These are all contraindications for using fingolimod. There is also EKG changes, including QT interval, and Mobitz type 2 second-degree heart block, third-degree heart block, or use of antiarrhythmic drugs. All of these can increase the risk for cardiac complications with fingolimod. For the 24-hour first dose observation, there are a number of risk factors that would indicate the patient should receive a full 24 hours of observation rather than just six hours, and those are outlined here. There are a few indications during the six-hour observation that would then lead a patient to be observed for additional time out to 24 hours. They include a decrease in heart rate during the six-hour post-dose observation below 45 beats per minute. Also, if the lowest heart rate is at the six-hour post-dose time point, the patient needs continued monitoring. New onset second degree or higher AV block or QT prolongation would also indicate the need for prolonged observation. This then highlights the importance of that post-dose EKG to monitor for EKG changes. In addition, patients with abnormal EKG at baseline or at the six-hour time point or with a cardiac history often would benefit from cardiology consultation for clearance or consideration of an alternate medication instead of fingolimod. Other risks with fingolimod include macular edema. This is very rare but is seen in, occasionally in patients. Risk for macular edema include diabetes, uveitis, and age over 50. This risk can be mitigated by looking for macular edema at baseline, and that is done through an ocular coherence tomography or OCT scan, and then repeating that at three months looking for asymptomatic changes. One should also have prompt evaluation if patients report visual or ocular symptoms, and that typically involves an OCT and or ophthalmology consultation. Varicella zoster and other herpes virus infections are also seen with fingolimod. These include disseminated varicella zoster virus infection, herpes virus encephalitis. These may be a primary infection or less commonly a reactivation, particularly with varicella zoster. The risk of herpes virus infections may be increased somewhat with concomitant steroid use. Methods to mitigate this risk is to screen all patients for varicella zoster serology. We used to do this just through a history of chickenpox in the past, but it's now become recognized that that is insufficient and that it is best to actually check for varicella zoster serology to ensure there is proper immunity to varicella zoster. If varicella zoster serology is negative, then one should vaccinate prior to starting fingolimod, and this would be the two vaccine vaccination, not just the one vaccine booster dose. Other risks with fingolimod include leukopenia or lymphopenia and increased liver enzymes, and these are managed mostly through monitoring. Some patients will report headaches and back pain, and these are managed predominantly through education and symptomatic management where needed. Turning now to teraflutamide. Teraflutamide risks include teratogenesis, liver irritation, reactivation of latent uh, tuberculosis, and alopecia, or hair loss. The benefits of teraflutamide are about a 30 to 35% reduction in annualized relapse rates. Perhaps the most concerning risk with teraflutamide is that of teratogenesis. It is currently labeled as a pregnancy category X, and one must ensure contraception in women and men of childbearing potential. There is the potential 
to use cholestyramine washout, and that is available if pregnancy occurs or patients desire pregnancy. The cholestyramine would then accelerate the removal of teraflutamide from the body. Nonetheless, one should probably consider alternative therapies in women of childbearing potential, uh, and particularly in patients who are considering childbearing in the future. Liver enzyme elevation is also seen with teraflutamide. Therefore, one should monitor for liver functions at baseline and every month for the first six months and then periodically after that. One would probably not want to use teraflutamide in patients with ongoing or previous liver disease and avoid other hepatotoxic medications in patients treated with teraflutamide. Uh, tuberculosis has also been reported in association with teraflutamide from clinical trials. Therefore, pretreatment screening with PPD or the gamma interferon release assay is indicated to screen patients for tuberculosis exposure prior to starting treatment. One should avoid use of teraflutamide in patients with a previous history of active tuberculosis. Now turn it to dimethylfumarate. The risks of dimethylfumarate include flushing, GI side effects, lymphopenia, and perhaps PML, or progressive multifocal leukencephalopathy. The benefits of dimethylfumarate are about a 50% reduction in annualized relapse rate. Let me start with flushing. Flushing, when it's seen in patients, involves the chest, neck, and face, and can be seen in up to 30% of patients. Its mechanism is probably similar to that seen with niacin, and accordingly, aspirin can be very effective in reducing it. Also, education can be helpful in warning patients about it and that it is a harmless skin flushing. Gastrointestinal side effects tend to be the more problematic side effects in these patients. This can involve nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain, although it typically improves over about a month. Mitigation strategies will include not using this drug in patients with a previous or ongoing history of gastritis or reflux, administration with food, and symptomatic treatment, which can include antiemetics, uh, antacids, either H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors, and antidiarrheals. Lymphopenia is also seen with dimethylfumarate. The nadir in the decrease in White blood cells is typically seen at about 12 months, although this lymphopenia has not been associated with an increased rate of adverse events or infections. Prolonged lymphopenia may be associated with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is an opportunistic infection. Mitigation for lymphopenia includes checking complete blood count at 6 and 12 months and annually thereafter and monitoring for infections. As I just mentioned, there have been some rare reports of PML among patients treated with other preparations of dimethylfumarate. To date, there have been four cases total, and it appears to be associated with prolonged and severe lymphopenia, thus emphasizing the importance of monitoring for lymphopenia in patients treated with dimethylfumarate. So in summary, when approaching treatment of a disease, we want to balance control of the disease with minimization of the risks and the side effects. When we apply this to multiple sclerosis, we want to consider the risk-benefit trade-off in individual patients when choosing an MS therapy. We also need to recognize that that risk-benefit trade-off can shift over time, so it needs to be reevaluated intermittently over the course of treatment. So let's now return back to the case we started with. A 35-year-old woman is diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis and asks for guidance on choosing a long-term MS disease-modifying therapy. If she had diabetes, which therapy would you want to avoid? One, interferon beta-1. Two, natalizumab. Three, fengolimod. Four, teraflutamide. Or five, dimethylfumarate. The correct answer here is three, fengolimod. A patient with diabetes has an increased risk of macular edema from fengolimod, and so one would probably want to choose a different therapy than fengolimod in a patient with diabetes. 
the next case, let's imagine the same woman, but instead she has persistent depression. In this situation, which therapy would you want to avoid? One, interferon beta-1, two, natalizumab, three, fingolimod, four, teraflutamide, or five, dimethylfumarate? The right answer is interferon beta-1. Interferon therapies are associated with increased depression. So in a patient with depression, that's a therapy you would probably want to avoid and instead select a different therapy. Case three, imagine the same woman instead has irritable bowel syndrome. Which therapy would you want to avoid in this case? One, interferon beta-1, two, natalizumab, three, fingolimod, four, teraflutamide, or five, dimethylfumarate? The correct answer is five, dimethylfumarate. Dimethylfumarate is associated with gastrointestinal symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Because of that, in a patient who already has irritable bowel syndrome, one may want to avoid dimethylfumarate and instead choose a different therapy. Now let's consider the same patient, and instead she is considering having children. In this situation, which therapy would you want to avoid? One, interferon beta-1, two, natalizumab, three, fingolimod, four, teraflutamide, or five, dimethylfumarate? The right answer is four, teraflutamide. A teraflutamide is considered pregnancy category X and is highly teratogenic. Accordingly, one would want to avoid using that in a patient of childbearing potential and particularly someone who is considering having children. Finally, consider the same patient. If she had tested positive for the John Cunningham virus, or JCV, which therapy would you want to avoid? One, interferon beta-1, two, natalizumab, three, fingolimod, four, teraflutamide, or five, dimethylfumarate? The right answer is two, natalizumab. Testing positive for the JC virus would increase the risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML. Accordingly, one may want to avoid this therapy and instead choose a different therapy in a patient who tests positive for the JC virus. That concludes our program. Thank you very much for joining us, and please come back again to take part in another program. Thanks, Dr. Fox, for your cogent comments on this timely and at times taxing topic. Decision-making in MS therapies has become even more complex as we've developed a larger group of more effective medicines. We more consciously have to think about risk versus benefit, taking into account the personalized characteristics that the patient brings to the encounter, as well as encouraging their participation in decision-making where risk and comfort are part of the equation. We have to recognize that some patients may be more comfortable with agents such as the interferons and glutiramer, which have a long track record of safety and known side effect profile. Others will be more willing to try a higher risk medication, but one with a proven higher efficacy such as natalizumab now that we're able to more readily predict risk and monitor to mitigate potential for life-threatening complications such as PML and anaphylaxis. Still, others may be candidates for one of the new oral medicines, recognizing that personal disease characteristics such as heart disease, tolerability for GI symptoms, plans for pregnancy, and presence of comorbid conditions may help steer the choice of medication. We've moved from a time when the physician might give the patient three kits for medicines and ask them to choose, to one where we need to meld the patient's comorbidities, experience with medicines, laboratory results, and personal preferences with our best judgment of the right medicine for the right patient at the right time. In our next MS Virtual Grand Rounds, we will discuss pediatric multiple sclerosis. Dr. Brenda Banwell from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia will be our speaker.